We got lots of good seats up here. <laughs> Come in, you know, we'll, we'll just have to be conspicuous. <laughs> yeah, no. Yes. I tell you a story about sitting in front. Sure. Way back when I was going to Western, I had to take a nice class. I think it was economics. Okay. And so I went over to the old campus, and everybody sat back here until the teacher walked in, and she was dynamite. Everybody was crawling over chairs to get up the front row. series? Yeah. I think it is. I think it's the fourth session of our Elder Care series. We want to welcome everybody uh, certainly to the series. And yes, latecomers, come on in and come on up. We save the good seats for them. <laughs> and you're not even late. You're not yeah. even late, for sure. So, um, first of all, I, I just want to say um, I've been in contact with the, the speaker who was program to be here, Shonda Brown. Um, who is, uh, you know, has done a lot of work in, in hospital and, and, and uh, family health settings, uh, who had this family emergency and couldn't appear today. I mean, she's very sorry. Continue to uh, have to, to, to extend prayers for her and her family. It's a, it's a very serious situation. So, um, we, and she thanks you for that. She really thanks you for that. So, um, Lynn and I had to think plan B, plan B, <laughs> and we're never sure about plan B, but we didn't have to look far, we did not have to look far, because within our own <laughs> POP community, we have this, this wealth of, of wonderful people and skills and training, and so we found uh, Donna and we found Sue. Uh, we're willing to step into plan B today, so we thank them very much for that. Uh, Donna is a registered nurse who's worked for over 20 years in home health and hospice care. And um, for the last four years, she has been actively working as a case manager in discharge planning. And I think at Bronson? It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. One of these. Yeah. And she is also certified as a hospice and palliative care person. And our, uh, Sue Jones has been um, very active as an OT person for years. Uh, as she worked 20 plus years at Brownson Hospital treating patients and, and uh, supervising in the rehab area. So um, she's um, very qualified in, in, in that area. And um, she's also worked uh, as uh, the development director and volunteer manager for several long, uh, local long nonprofits. Some of you probably know that. Um, and has completed some doula training, which I hopefully she'll talk a little bit about that too. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, so thank you both very much for uh, these are the angels that have uh, flown into our midst today. So we thank them for being here. Thank you. Well, thanks, Yvonne. Glad you're all here today. We don't have a PowerPoint. We apologize for that. Um, but hopefully the handouts will help you, and also we can get those to um, Tamara. I think we can email them out if you want electronic versions of anything, but. Um, want to try to talk about we're, kind of three things. Hospitalization, if you are a loved one or someone that you know is hospitalized, um, we're going to talk about district planning, and we're going to talk about some rehabilitation. And I've got some show and tell things, so hopefully it'll be an a informative um, session that you can grab some tidbits from that, and um, that will help you. So in the handout, that's the first one that you see. Well, no, it's this one. Um, talking first about pre-planning, and, and it's funny, it's interesting because
because all of the sessions so far, you know, we're kind of building on each other's presentations or we're, we're um, reinforcing some of the common themes. So uh, pre-planning or preparing for a possible hospitalization, whether it's your own or a loved one or a family member, um, one of the things to think about is kind of some to-go paperwork. Um, if you think, you know, your, your person or you may end up needing that um, or just because you want to be prepared. So having somewhere written down a list of medications, a list of your physicians, a um, list of surgeries, things like that, any allergies, um, and then important paperwork. So we're going to have the next two sessions. It's exciting that we're going to have talks about, you know, advanced directives and some of that, some of those forms, HIPAA forms. Um, but having that to go so that if there is an emergency, you know, for me, my mother was five hours away, being able to have that. Um, she has a copy, we have a copy. Um, making sure that everybody's kind of on the same page so you're not r racing around if there's a, an emergent situation. Um, having emergency contacts, um, whether it's for you, whether it's for your loved one. In our case, one of our neighbors who's um, uh, aging, she said, it would it be okay if I gave you my children's names and phone numbers and contact information just in case you notice that something happens to me, you can contact them. So we loaded that in our phone. We're not her, her emergency contact. We don't know anything about her medical situation, but it, it actually made me relieved thinking, you know, what? Ha she lives alone. What happens if something happens to her? Who can I reach out to? So making sure that your community kind of knows um, knows those contacts. Yeah. It would be a really great idea to give the church your emergency contacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if Tamara can load that, but yeah. 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 we can put it in your file. There you go. There okay. Go. Um, also, your legal names. Yeah. Because if you go in the hospital and you don't go by your legal name, they won't let me in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can't find you. So. Okay. Um, knowing the wishes of the person, or if it's you, making sure that you communicated that. Again, we're not going to talk much about that because that's going to be coming up in the next couple of sessions. But what are your wishes? Do you have advanced directives? What do you want to do for resuscitation and CPR and all that? Just having those conversations in advance. Um, and, you know, for some people it's very difficult to talk about that. Um, the hope is that if we can kind of normalize those discussions and not make it taboo, um, it's just really preparing loved ones, family, yourself, um, so that you're, everybody's on the same page if, when, if and when something happens. There's, for pre-planning, um, we have here consider a membership with an ambulance company. Not everybody knows that there is such a thing. So for some folks, if they think, you know, if they've had to be transported to the hospital, um, if they've got conditions where every now and then or whatever, they're, um, they're needing that or they need wheelchair transportation by an ambulance company, um, there are memberships, and that's across the country. Um, when I did a quick Google search, it cost, I think, $60 for the year. Um, and it's a huge cost savings because an ambulance, I don't know if any of you have been transported by an ambulance, but it's very, very expensive. And then depending on your insurance, it may or may not cover. Um, so just something to consider, to look into if that's something that you or someone you know might benefit from that. And then planning ahead for potential issues, for medical crises, or maybe changing in living situations. So we've had, I think it was last week, um, well, and a couple of sessions, talking about, you know, if you or a loved one are thinking that down the road or if there's an emergency, you may need to leave your house or you may need to move into assisted living or you don't think this two-story house is going to do well for you if something happens, um, start early. Start thinking about, you know, for you or someone you're caring for, what, is their what would their insurance cover? Um, seeing what are the resources in our community, you know, we've been able now to have several um, wonderful organizations present to us, so learning about that. Um, you know, if you think um, perhaps if something happens, the next step will be assisted living or something like that, or a skilled nursing home facility, um, doing some, some, some trips in advance, you know, driving around, meeting with people, um, just to give a kind of a sense, um, there are people who, you know, they can drive around and say, I would never, ever, ever want to be here. Or conversely, I, this looks really good. This might be a consideration. And knowing that, you know, you may do some kind of recon now and 
you may not need something until maybe a year or more later, but at least you're kind of getting a sense for what's there in your community or if you, the person you're caring for or a family member or friend lives out of town, out of state, um, just doing some of that while there's not that pressure. And Donna's going to talk about this church planning if you're in the hospital, but um, you know, my thing is um, the more you can prepare in advance, not to be a doomsday, but just prepare what you can prepare. Um, and I forgot to say that at the end, we're, we're happy to take questions um, and all of that, and we're available if you have to leave. I know some people have to leave early for choir and things, so know that we're um, available for questions. So then we kind of transition to in the hospital. So you or a loved one or um, someone you know is in the hospital, one of my big things is advocacy. I think every person needs an advocate of some sort. Um, in the hospital, it's really helping with communication, with coordination of care, with helping to support that person, um, telling the story, being the eyes and ears of someone. Um, you know, in my situation, both my parents are deceased, but my dad had a really complex medical history. And my mom kept copious notes, and she had a to-go binder. <laughs> and if something happened or he went to a doctor's office, it was throughout his life, his family doctor would say, well, I think I'm going to start you on this medication. And she could quickly look and say, no, 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 because the cardiologist said never put him on that medication. Or, you know, the, the, um, the reverse of that, if the specialist wanted to start him on something. Now, an electronic day, you know, that's easier because you can search if, if you have it on your phone or something like that. But um, making sure that you're able to help speak up for the person. And it can be intimidating for some to say to a physician or a specialist or someone else in authority or you know who's who's providing the care like mm, I'm not sure that's the best thing but do speak up um, and ask those questions um, <clears throat> I wrote I hear one of the bullet points is pacing so if you are your well if your loved one or your whoever you're caring for if they're in the hospital it's a marathon <laughs> it's not a sprint um, <clears throat> I saw so many families who would do round the clock, 24-7, sitting at the bedside, even when the person was pretty stable, um, even when they're um, medically they were taken care of. And we always encourage them, it, once you feel comfortable, once your loved one is out of that um, you know, life and death critical situation, go home, <laughs> get some rest, take care of what you need to take care of, especially when that person goes home, you know, if you're already just exhausted, that's going to be really hard to do, uh, to provide that care. Um, so pacing yourself, um, you know, one of the, and, and the other part of that is um, asking for or receiving help. For me, it's hard for me to ask for help. Hard to accept help sometimes. When my mom was in the hospital for a month and I was driving back and forth about 45 minutes from the hospital to her home where I was staying, one of her friends, without me even asking, put a cooler on my mom's porch I come home at you know eight o'clock at night after a full day, and there was something that I could just throw in the microwave, and that was the best gift for me because I never would have said, um, "Could someone help me with this?" But, so thinking about that, if you're on the receiving end or the giving end, um, all those little things, you know, if someone says, "Can I help you grocery shop?" Take them up on it. Um, just making sure that you're taking care of yourself. It's that whole. And I know one of the presenters talked about the oxygen mask. Put it on yourself so you've got the reserve then to help others. Um, and then knowing that um, if your loved one is in the hospital, you know, there's so many people who might be part of that team, right? You've got physicians, you've got therapists, you've got specialists, um, knowing that you're not alone, and there are some members of the team who you really should get to know and interact with, and that's the medical social worker and the discharge planner or case manager. Um, critical, critical um, members of the team and really um, wonderful people to help, and that's where Donna's going to talk more about the discharge planning part. Thank you. Thanks, Sue, and thanks, <coughs> Yvonne and Lynn, for inviting me to speak. Um, I do work as a case manager, um, and case management is across the nation, so it really truly doesn't matter where I work. It's uh, There's actually a national certification in case management. Usually the case manager is either an RN or a medical social worker. Um, so now we'll go to the colored um, 
handout with levels of care. So this is a, a way to think about the topic that we're, we're talking about this morning as, in terms of levels of care. And most of us in this room are at the level of care where we're home and independent. <laughs> Basically, we don't need any assistance. So there's that level of care, but at the other end of the spectrum would be the hospital. So the hospital level of care would, might be considered our highest level of care. And then you move all the way to independence. But um, hospital, of course, there's the emergency room, there's inpatient hospital stay, and there's observation. Sometimes people come in through the emergency room and it's not quite sure which way they're gonna go and they maybe just need to be observed for 24 to 48 hours. But in any of these um, areas of the hospital, there is a case manager available to patients and families. So uh, feel free, as Sue mentioned, to contact or to let your nurse know or somebody know, I'd like to talk with the case manager and they'll be sure to get in touch with you. Um, the, and I would like to say that there's medical criteria for being in the hospital. So a person needs hospitalization they meet that medical criteria, they're an inpatient. Once they're no longer needing the hospital level of care, then you wanna move into the next most appropriate level of care. For some people it will be simply going back home and they're fine. For others, there's a higher level of care than um, you know, home and independent, but not quite the level of being in the hospital. So in that movement, there is what's called LTAC, a long-term acute care hospital, where there are complicated medical issues. There could be a ventilator, and they're needing to be weaned off that ventilator, but they need monitoring in an acute care setting. Uh, wound care that's complicated, IV therapy, tube feedings, severe deconditioning. So uh, this is a... a fairly high level of care, medical management, prolonged stay, they may need weeks or months or two to, to be in this type of setting. So that is um, a very specialized high level of care, but not quite being in the hospital. Um, and then from there we might move to rehabilitation. And there's really two levels of rehabilitation where you stay someplace uh, for the rehab versus being at home and getting rehab from your house. So those um, two places that you might stay, it's determined by the intensity of care that would meet your needs. So the higher intensity rehabilitation would entail an inpatient rehabilitation facility. So you would go to an inpatient rehabilitation facility, you would stay there, and you would receive at least three hours per day of therapy. That could be physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, that, you know, all wrapped in you know, three hours total um, for five to six days a week. And then along with that, of course, you receive your medical care. Um, a lower level or lower intensity of rehab, that takes place generally in a skilled nursing facility. So then you would stay in the rehab section of that skilled nursing facility and you would receive therapy anywhere from a quarter to a half hour at a very low level to one or two hours per day, five days a week. So you still receive you know, your therapy, not quite as high intensity, but what will meet the patient's need, what can they tolerate, what would move them along to um, the best quality of life. Now with both um, high intensity and low intensity rehab, there needs to be a potential to improve. 
Uh, so when you're in the hospital, you'll be questioned about what was your prior functional level before you came in the hospital. Were you independent? Were you already needing to use the wheelchair? Were you already, um, you know, did you not have mobility of your left upper extremity? You know, these things. So prior functional abilities will help to determine what the goals are and to set realistic goals. But uh, potential to improve is one thing that would be needed for both um, levels of rehab. Uh, the ability to participate in rehab. Um, some people, particularly with cognitive impairment, they're, they're not able to follow directions. They really wouldn't, there wouldn't perhaps not be that potential to improve. Um, you need to be medically stable so that you're, um, you know, not needing to go back in the hospital for attention medically, but you're stable medically, um, and that you are expected to return to the community. So if you were living at home previously, your goal might naturally be, I want to get back home, but perhaps there needs to be some home modifications, some additional support in the home, but that, you know, or... Perhaps um, the, the uh, return to community could be moving in with a family member, perhaps going to assisted living, but um, some you know expectation of being discharged from high intensity or low intensity rehab because those are temporary settings. Um, and then I put a slide in here on skilled nursing facility. I know a couple weeks ago the person from PACE talked about uh, long-term care at a skilled nursing facility. So that's a different level of care than rehab at a skilled nursing facility. If a person goes into a skilled nursing facility for long-term care, it's expected they would be there then for a prolonged period of time and they would receive the care they need and not necessarily therapy, although therapies are available, but there, it's more of what might be termed the custodial level of care. Um, and the PACE person talked about level of care determination, LOCD, so that details of that are available on the internet, but I just outlined the main areas that are looked at in terms of level of care determination for skilled nursing facility. They look at activities of daily living, ranging, of course, anywhere from being totally dependent to independent, you know, partially dependent in between there. So there's a rating system related to activities of daily living, cognitive performance. Uh, they look at memory, processing of information, ability to express yourself and make your needs known. Um, also, they look at significant clinical uh, stability or instability, uh, physician visits, orders, treatment and conditions. Uh, does the patient require hemodialysis? Are they on oxygen, etc.? So those are the main areas that are looked at in determining the level of care for a, a skilled nursing facility. So then we move on to home health care, and this level of care um, incorporates nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and language pathology, registered dietitian, medical social work, and home health aid. Those are the disciplines that could potentially come to the home under a Medicare certified home health agency. So I'm talking Medicare certified. This would be covered under your insurance. They do uh, require, there's a skilled need. There's a reason why a person would need the nurse, why they need physical therapy, et cetera. Um, the person must be primarily homebound. Uh, so generally, if somebody's been in the hospital, they would perhaps be considered homebound at least for a short period of time maybe just the first week or so, or um, they, when they do get out, it's with difficulty, and when they do get out, it's primarily for medical appointments. 
Um, they do allow coming to church as part, you know, as part of being able to get out. Um, it's intermittent service only. So with the certified Medicare certified home health care, uh, they do not provide or cover hourly service. It's intermittent, so the nurse would come in, do what needs to be done, report to the doctor, leave. The therapist would come in, help set up a, a therapy plan, and then they would leave. Um, and then it also requires physician orders, so your primary care provider would uh, be in communication and, and most likely the one signing those orders for home care. And then you can move on the continuum to assisted living, which um, provides the housing, the meals, uh, supervision, but a person uh, may not be appropriate for assisted living if they require 24-7 care. You know, that may be, maybe they need a, a different level of care, a little higher level of care than assisted living if they require a 24-7. Um, they're licensed by the state, um, it's either private pay or long-term care insurance. And in assisted living, many of them do have uh, contracts with therapy, so there might be in-house, so to speak, um, therapy at the assisted living, but uh, if not, people can also have home health care come to assisted living or hospice could come to assisted living. Um, and then moving along, there's outpatient services, which um, might be like cardiac rehab, a diabetic clinic, a stroke clinic or simply getting your prescription from your doctor to go to whichever physical therapy location you're interested in. Um, it's very important to know that any of these levels of care, if you went to you know, rehab, home health care, assisted living, uh, outpatient services, it's patient and family choice. So this is when Sue was talking about pre-planning if you know you're having a procedure, you, you possibly might want home health care or you possibly might need rehab, look into those options beforehand as much as possible because that will benefit you uh, to be familiar with the resources available in your community and what your choices would be. It would, um, I believe, actually give you more choice if you look into it ahead of time because at the last minute your choices might be more limited so thank you so much um sometimes there's a delay in getting there you know weekends. oh yeah that yeah sue had just mentioned um both of us and we worked in the hospital are familiar with there could be a delay in getting to the appropriate setting now why is this so somebody is no longer in need of hospital level care so you're ready to move on but well maybe you're going to rehab do they have a bed available um, there maybe needs to be a male bed a female bed um, so you have to make sure there's a bed available do you need insurance prior authorization so the case manager will submit for insurance prior authorization once the assurance company reviews, then um, we could, you know, help you out with that determination. Is it the weekend? <laughs> because you make a referral to a rehab setting. Well, the director of nursing and all the intake personnel, they're not available on the weekend necessarily. Some are, but many aren't. So then it's Monday before you even find out whether or not you have a bed available, and once that happens, then you have to get insurance prior authorization. So it, it's a process. And even with home health care, um, you know, do they have the therapist available in the area where you live? And so you want to get accepted at the place you would like, and the sooner you get that in process, um, it's simply to your benefit to be able to move on to the most appropriate next area. Sorry to interrupt. A couple there's questions. a there's a car in the parking lot. It's a silver, silver BMW. Oh, the hatch, the hatch, the hatch, is, hatch is open. Oh. oh and okay. we just want to make sure if that's somebody's car, they want to. I'm gonna go check, but I don't know. Okay. 
So now back to Sue. Oh, I, have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick, quick question about weekends. So in the hospital, do you find it's the same even if you're not going to a facility that weekend discharge is just like not very well coordinated or just getting them sent home or do you feel like that's, I feel like it, no matter where you are on the weekend, it's different than it is during the weekdays. It is different on the weekends. Um, it depends on what is needed. Um, their delay with facility placement on the weekend is that much more likely. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're going to, with home health care, um, generally some of the home health care agencies may accept you. Some may say, well, we have to get the doctor's order, so we have to wait till Monday because we have to call their primary care provider and make sure the physician is on board with receiving the services, most are, especially when there's documentation of conditions from uh, the hospital. But, you know, that possibly could be a delay till Monday. Um, but your primary care physician doesn't really pay attention to you when you're in the hospital, right? You're just right, under the care the of a hospital doctor. Right, it's the hospital But then all of a sudden it has to switch back over to yeah. the primary care provider. Yeah. And so then you're subject to the weekdays, or I guess maybe they have after hours. But So it's yeah. possible. And then occasionally it's medication also, because there's maybe a new or changed medication that, well, you need it, but if your pharmacy isn't open on Sunday, or, you know, the... I mean, possibly, yeah, or if there's IV therapy, yeah. it really all depends. Yeah. Um, some yes. weekend discharge are just smooth and, and no problem, but it depends on what the need is. Yeah. Well, along that line, um, I was interested, I think you both talked about taking care of yourself. And so my dad was recently hospitalized, and my one sister felt we needed to have him covered round the clock between the three of us. Well, her reasoning was a doctor might come in and talk to him, and we won't know what they said, and then also discharge. What if none of us are there, and they he, he they won't discharge him to nobody, right? Somebody has to take him home? Yeah, there always has to be a safe discharge plan, so that may be a... A delay they can't put them in a safe. taxi or anything or let's we can talk about okay. transportation later mm -hmm. yeah so he wants to go on to yeah. something um, I will just say good point about um, you know the 24 7 um, it's great to be there if the doctor's going to be there. You never know when a doctor will be there. So, you know, I pitched, I was there early, and I as soon as the doc left, I knew, okay, I can now go home, say whenever that is. Sometimes, you know, they come at the crack of dawn, and sometimes it's really late in the evening, so you really don't know. Um, but, you know, the whole overnight thing, if you don't have to do that, it's okay. Um, so moving on to rehabilitation. Um, as an OT, in the, in, in the rehab world, the goals are, are pretty simple. It's um, look at what does the person want to do and what are the challenges preventing them from being able to do that. And are, there, is there a way to help maximize independence while making sure the person is safe? So it's kind of looking at that whole, the whole um, world of the person. You know, what are they struggling with and are there any, is there anything that can be done uh, to help with that? So for, for me as a therapist, advocacy from the family was always really helpful, especially if the person had some memory issues or wasn't able to communicate. As, um, as Donna said, you know, it's really helpful to know what was the status of the person before they came into the hospital. Um, you know, for me, when I started my career, I remember vividly a person who had really limited range of motion in their arm, and I thought, okay, we've got to deal with that. Well, it wasn't until like three days later that the family said, oh yeah, 40 years ago they fell and they never had the ability to move that. Well, that wasn't documented anywhere in the chart, you know, so I was focused on that and it was the family who was able to say no or you know what, they really were having balance issues before they came in. This is kind of pre-status. This is new. Um, so being that advocate to help with um, communicating um, and then also helping with realistic goals, especially if the person's going to be going home. <laughs> What can you help with and what can't you? Um, as caregivers, as um, people who are key in the life of somebody, it's okay to say, this is beyond what I can give. Um, 
you know, for me, I being a therapist when my mom needed to be um, in hospice services, I knew taking her home was not the best place because it was just going to be me primarily. So I had to make those choices. And, and I guess my one of the things I want to communicate is it's okay for you to say, I don't know that I can do this. Or, yep, I'm equipped and I can handle this. So um, helping with the discussion about expectations. Um, the other part is, um, and I... Again, if your person's in the hospital or if they go on to outpatient therapy or whatever, as a therapist, there were times when it was wonderful to have the family member present during the treatment session. And then there were times when it was really helpful for the family not to be present <laughs> in the therapy session. So please don't be offended if someone, if a therapist or someone says to you, you know what, it would be best if you just, you know, go get a cup of coffee or something while I do this. Um, I, I, I know that, you know, for some members, Myself included, I literally had to bite my tongue sometimes, you know, because I would want to jump in. I wouldn't want to answer. I'd want to help do something for the person. And so just know that may come up, especially if you're in a hospital. Or there might be some evaluations. I had to do one to assess um, the cognitive status of people, and there couldn't be other people in the room. So explaining, this is not personal, but I need some time with your with your person. Um Environmental modifications, adaptive devices. I love this part. I love this part of my career, my life, my, my whatever. Um, there's a lot of equipment available. There's a lot of stuff that people can use, can get, can have. When I started back in the day, it, you couldn't just go to a Meyer or Walmart or Rite Aid and get stuff. You had to order it from a specialty company. And now with, with Amazon, with you know it becoming more normalized, it's fabulous. So. Um, one of the things that I as a therapist and you as a caregiver might need to remember is we can give you all sorts of things, we can, but if you're, it's not going to be used or it's going to be more cumbersome, it doesn't make any difference then. They don't, so you don't need it. So always keep that in mind. I, um, I could make recommendations until I was blue in the face. But if the person's like, thank you, but no, <laughs> you know, I, I need to respect that. It's always the person's wishes. So I kind of brainstormed with what might be some real practical information that you might want to know. So I have some show and tell, and I have some bolt lists. So some of this stuff for me, um, it's like, well, it's, it's interesting because some people don't even think about this or know about this, and I have to step back and say, wow, there's a whole world out there that I just want folks to know about. So um, things like de decreased grip. So as people um, age or sometimes due to a medical condition, if they don't have good grip, they don't have good strength, or they have arthritis and can't hold things, so holding a pen, holding a real skinny uh, fork or you know utensil, holding a toothbrush might be real difficult. So there are things that you can get, like built up foam is what this is called. And they have it of all different um, uh, diameters. Put it on a skinny pen, put it on a utensil. And then you go from having to hold down like this to being able to not have to grip so, so hard so tightly. Um, or, you know, instead of having the skinny pens, <laughs> look at, you know, nowadays you can get really fat pens. <laughs> so simple device, simple thing, it doesn't cost much. Um, I've even had patients who, and even for myself, I'm like I don't have any foam at home. <laughs> so taking a piece of material, or this is just a napkin that I wadded up, folded around, taped around a fork, and then it would help me if I wasn't able to grip things. That make sense? Yeah. Um, all right, let's see. So, Bigger toothbrushes, you know, some of the toothbrushes are skinny. I'm not, I'm not selling anything, I'm just saying there are toothbrushes that have a really big handle. Much easier to hold than something that's really skinny. Um, the, other, the other part, and I almost put batteries in this, but I knew during church it would go off. Um, <laughs> Pastor Rachel, you can thank me for taking out the batteries. At close there are all sorts of devices now for helping to take the lid for can openers. You push a button. It rotates around, it, it clamps down. Um, I think this was maybe $20, $15, $20. There's all sorts of different kinds. Um, but you know, can openers are, t are hard to manipulate. Um, and you can come up afterwards and 
see and, and touch all this, but um, I love that. I love that there are, there are things um, for that. And I'm looking at my notes here. Tremors in your arms or your hands. So some people have, whether it's Parkinson's or just as um, some people age, they start to, to get some tremors. It's difficult to feed yourself then or to write or something. So one of the things that you can do so, that might be effective, might not, are just simple wrist weights. Um, for some folks, just having that weight will stop the tremors, enough that they can be more functional. Or, you know, a bigger arm weight that you put on. Um, so for some of, and I worked mainly in the, in the hospital setting, so some of this, you know, we trialed, but this is where, especially with outpatient therapy or home health, you know, they can, um, they can help you problem solve too. With what, again, what are the issues and is there anything available that might be able to help you. Um, let's see, the other part then, oh, and even for, for um, utensils, they make weighted utensils. So they're heavy um, or heavier than normal. So again, for tremors, it helps to decrease that. Um, and those are, you can get them now, just Google, you know, weighted utensils, and there's a million of them out there. Some folks have difficulty reaching, bending, whether it's a back issue or whatever. Um, how many of you have used or have one of these reachers? Right? <laughs> okay, several of you. This is my favorite tool. I've used this since my first knee surgery in seventh grade. So whether it's, you know, I can't bend over because I've hurt my back, you can grab things. To get my box of stuff, last night from the basement, I have a box that says OT stuff. I use my reacher to grab the box because I wasn't going to climb up there. Um, but you can, you know, that just helps you to be able to still sit, stand, and reach things. This thing can help you get dressed. So instead of bending over to put your pants on, you know, you can use this to help clamp your pants on, pull them up enough that then you can reach things. Um, these used to be a specialty item. Now I've seen them at Meyer last night for $14.99. <laughs> you know, they're pretty standard. Now, they may look different. They, some of them are like, like a lobster claw. It's okay, they do the same thing. They just help um, you to be able to be more independent with whatever you need. Um, and that's called a reacher. Everyone will be able to help you with that part. Um, difficulty dressing. So we talked about a reacher. Um, they're also becoming more and more common. Things like elastic shoelaces. This is just one version that um, that I bought, but they have some now instead of like if you're if you don't have good dexterity or aren't able to bend over um, a lot to tie your shoes, they have some where it's elastic shoelaces and you just pull a, a, a little thing to tighten it. And so you don't have to manipulate little bows and things or they're elastic and you don't have to um, <coughs> to tie them. So I know these are um, I found them at just about anywhere now, like VNA. I just was there for a family member and bought some with the little uh, clamp on it. And uh, that works wonders. So then if you have that and maybe a long handle shoehorn or something, that really helps people be independent with putting on shoes. Now, some people might say, I don't want to do all this, or I don't want my shoelaces to be weird looking. Let your family member help if your family member can help. Um, but know that there are options out there. Um, button hooks, sometimes people, especially if they've had a stroke or something or they've had surgery and they can only use one hand, there's something called a button hook, which you thread through the hole in your button and you go through and you, you wrap your, kind of goes around the button and you pull it through. It's super cool. It's, it's little, um, it's one of those kind of obscure devices that people don't know about, but Again, if you're living alone, or if you just want to be independent, um, there's something for that. Um, adaptive clothing, that's becoming more and more available online. Like when I had shoulder surgery, I didn't know if I was going to be coming out for months in a pillow and I couldn't move at all, um, or if I'd be in a sling or whatever. So I asked a friend who sewed, could she take a regular shirt and, ins and ins uh, cut the sleeve and just put snaps? so that I didn't have to thread my arm through. That was fabulous. For the first week, I lived on those things. 
Um, you know, and I had one that was one-sided. Um, the other one, I said, can you do both so that I don't look kind of weird on public? <laughs> Although now anything goes with fashion, so probably the one-sided would have been fine. Um, this thing um, is, anybody know what this is? It's a leg a lifter. It's a, it's a leash. It's not a leash for a person. No, but so some people, um, they have difficulty lifting their leg to, for whatever. You can put this around your foot. I can't bring my foot up that high so you can see, but trust me, you put your foot in there and you can then lift your leg to move it over. Now, this is one of those things that we obviously want people to use their muscles. We don't want them to rely on gadgets and things like that, but. If you're really stuck and talk to your therapist, talk to your doctor and say, you know, I, I heard from this therapist that there's something out there. This could be really helpful for people. Um, but it is very big. So um, then we get to, let's see, bathing. So uh, if you heard of tub benches, tub shower chairs, things like that, um, huge proponent of that. I think they're great. There's also one that I don't know if it, people are familiar with where instead of having to step into the tub and sit, there's an extension piece that's outside of the tub. So you sit down and then you can scoot yourself or they slide. Um, for some people that's much safer um, or better for their condition so they don't have to swing their legs in and then sit down. So knowing that now many different options <laughs> for even tub, tub chairs, um, um, long hair, or I'm not long hair, um, Handheld shower hoses, okay, if you need that, be really helpful so that you don't have to stand, you don't have to move around, you can take the wand, you can turn it on and off as you need to. Now they're available just about everywhere and very affordable, um, so a great tool to have. All right, and then we talk about difficulty eating or cooking. Um, so one of the things that is available, so think about if you only had the use of one hand, one arm, and you have to cut food. Very difficult to cut the food um, without holding onto it with the other hand. There's something called a rocker knife. And this is super sharp. What you can do is, if you've got, and, and you can cut through anything, um, if you've got one hand, instead of cutting this way, slicing, you rock it, and it cuts your, your food. Um, really hand, Really helpful for some. Um, the other thing that is helpful if you have just use of one arm, it's called a plate guard. So this just snaps onto any plate, just about, unless you have kind of the really thick uh, plates or china or something. But so think about if you've got spaghetti, you've got peas, you've got something, and usually you know you have to use both hands so that you can push into the one hand to get it on your utensils. This becomes your wall. Okay, and then you can be independent with things. When I had my shoulder surgery, again, I was going to be fiercely independent, <laughs> um, especially as an OT. I'm like, I have to figure this out. So in advance, uh, because I didn't know what I would need, I bought a rocker knife and I bought a plate guard because I was not about to say, you know, can you cut my food, you feel? Or, you know, being able to go out to dinner. I've had patients who they would just, you know, this is very incognito. I'm sure they have a thousand different colors now. Put it on your plate and you can be independent. Um, the other part with cooking would be um, non-stick, don't look at how dirty this one, this is baking, but you know something that we call it Dysum or the, just the non-stick um, thing so that if you're working on something and you don't have ability to hold real tightly to something, it's not going to slide off your counter. So, you know, jar openers, this now is sold everywhere. Um, again, practical information, practical tool that can help you be able to do things more independently. Um, let's see what else we have in that part. And then, um, then we get to driving challenges. So, hot topic with a lot of folks. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk about some resources in a second, but there are driving centers where they will do an evaluation. They may help <coughs> suggest they'll do it on the road. They might help with modifications. So, for instance, I've had people who have had um, a stroke or whatever, and they've had a loss of vision or partial vision. There are modified mirrors that can be put into the car 
to kind of help compensate for that loss of vision. Um, sometimes insurance will pay for things, sometimes they won't. Just like for all of this stuff, it depends on your insurance. Sometimes they'll cover it, sometimes you'll have to advocate and say, look, my loved one lives alone or I live alone, this would help me immensely. Um, so you just have to kind of look into, into your insurance plan. But So for driving, um, know that there are lots of different modifications. This is something, and Lynn, do you want to tell? You're, it's the it's a puller yeah, okay. that you use when you do, do. So, transport. So Mike and I both transport senior seniors, as we call them, um, <laughs> as we fit in the earlier category. Um, anyway, um, you just when uh, when you go to close your door, there's like a little loop that your door connects into. It just looks kind of like this. So the the uh, frame is here. Yeah. And your door swings into this and, yeah. and it locks, right? But this goes into there when the door's open. And it's a way to push yourself up. So you're uh, in the, the, driver, or the passenger seat and you're gripping onto the door. But now you have something else to grip onto. And it just slides right in there. It's really, really and it's easy. Really stable. And there's six whole dollars, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's a really good thing to have. And sometimes, you know, like Mike right now, <laughs> who can't walk. Right. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a lifesaver. It's, so. it's for helping someone get out of the car. Yeah, but yeah. in, too. In the Because in in yeah. yeah. if you grip onto something, then you're not worried about whether your butt's going to slip off the... Mm -hmm. See. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't even What's ask it. Uh, you. A door gripper or uh, handle, door uh, car handle claw, I think. Now with with Google, I mean, you just keep typing in your keywords. And it's like, wow. Um, the other part for. Oh, that, that device can also be used to break the window. Yeah, I was just going to say if you're in an emergency situation. The other thing that they have for cars, um, like my dad benefited from this, is it's kind of a swivel, lazy Susan, which I hate that term, but um, you sit on it, you sit and turn the swivel, but you can, sit there, spins, you can sit there and it'll, you can spin around on it instead of having to, you know, lift your legs around, um, put it under a cushion or something. We got that, I don't know where my mom found that, but those are becoming more standard as well. So it makes it hold on to see. It's, it's just kind of for what? So it doesn't move around. There's kind of a um, just a base to it that it holds it. that holds it in there. Yeah. So again, a million different things. These are just the things that I own. <laughs> in my world, I've used it at some point. Um, but know that um, there's a lot out there now for things uh, if you need help with that. Um, Real quick, I am going to do a PSA that I am a firm believer that if you're somebody who's really, really dominant in one hand, start using your other one. There may be a time that you have to do that and use your non-dominant hand. So when I had shoulder surgery, um, you know, I'm fortunate that I was able to, and especially going through OT school, I had to learn how to tie like, the shoelaces one-handed and all sorts of weird things. But um, start brushing your teeth. Start, you know, uh, eating with your non-dominant hand. One of the good things, you know, if you fill up a pill, if you have multiple vitamins or whatever, and you're filling up a pill case, try. Don't do it over the sink. If it goes out, <laughs> do it somewhere on the table. But picking up the pills, trying to put them in your hand, just for that fine motor coordination. Jigsaw um, puzzles. Jigsaw puzzles. Yeah, anything that you can do with your other side. The other part would be balance. Balance is a huge thing. I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, work on your balance. It doesn't have to be extreme yoga poses, but while you're brushing your teeth, maybe not with your non-dominant hand, stand on one leg, you know, for a while, or washing dishes, watching a commercial, TV, whatever, just starting to engage your brain so that, you know, if and when the time might come, that's something that you've already been practicing. Super helpful for the brain. Um, all right, so on the back of your sheets, um, real quickly, and we'll save you some time. Um, I thought, all right, if I, if I, I want to know what's in my community for different things. So um, there's Disability Network, Southwest Michigan, great kind of, I call repository of information. So you can call them and ask for an intake and referral specialist and say, 
I know someone who's really struggling with bleh, or I don't know if there's even a resource for whatever. They can help kind of steer you in the right direction. There's a place called Lending Hands, a nonprofit. I don't know if any of you have used them, know about them. Um, you can, they have limited items that you can borrow. You don't have to rent them, you don't have to pay for them. So wheelchairs, tub benches, things like that. Um, and they're, they're local. You can call them and say, I'm looking for whatever, a scooter, I'm looking for a tub bench, and they can tell you if they have that. This catalog of metal, medical equipment, that's kind of this stuff. And if you just remember Salmon Preston, some of these websites are just gigantic, but the links to them. Um, but you can go into um, their site or you can just go through Google and write help with gripping items, help with getting dressed, and they will show you then pages of items that, that are available. Driving assessment and vehicle modifications. I'm super excited about this one. Um, it's been a while since I had to figure out, do we have anything in our community? Um, there is a place, it's called Drivewell, Michigan. It's by Field Fabric. Um, an occupational therapist hmm. it, um, is the evaluator. And so if you or your loved one, you think, I'm not sure that I should be driving, I'm not sure that they should be driving, or they've had something happen. I mean, we have people who are paralyzed and they go through that and you know they get hand modifications <laughs> to be able to drive. So this place will do an assessment, <coughs> kind of a tabletop assessment as we say, to see cognitively are they safe, do they have the mobility um, to be safe. And then they will do an on the road driving uh, evaluation and then they can give recommendations. Um, insurance, unless it's workers comp or uh, motor vehicle cr um, crash, they, the insurance probably doesn't cover it. For me, if I had a loved one who was on the fence and was agreeable to doing something like that, for, I think it was two or three hundred dollars for an assessment. Yeah. I'm all in, <laughs> you know. So, um, and then I gave a site um, here for you know a, a lot of this is in our own community, uh, Michigan.gov. If you go in and Google the rehab training and driving services, it will give you sites all over the state of Michigan. I actually Googled for a family member in North Carolina. I said driver assessment center and found one there. So know that that's a national thing. We are very fortunate to have one in, in Kalamazoo. Um, and then low vision, macular degeneration. You know, I know that some people as they age, that might become an issue. Know that there's a clinic for that, that you can go and say, be evaluated and see are there different modifications that can be done to your TV, to your whatever. To help you be able to see better so not exhaustive list but just something to um to think about the other there's a handout i didn't have enough for everybody but if you're interested um it's hard to talk about dr stopping driving <laughs> okay so the the drive well uh, site they actually on their website had some different handouts uh, or pdfs and one of them was top tips for discussing when it's time to stop driving I thought, you know what, that's pretty relevant, it, and it goes through what's the best approach, when might you do this, so um, if you want one, it's in the back of the room, if we run out, I'm happy to get you one, so. So I know this is a ton of information, <laughs> we're hoping that through this, you know, you, you leave getting a little bit more knowledge about something, um, know that there's a world of opportunities, you as a caregiver, or you as yourself, um, you don't have to, you're not on an island and hopefully um, you can dive into some of these resources to help you. So, questions for either of us? Yeah, Ray? Will, will the Lending Hands case use metal, medical equipment? Yes, yes, yeah, they will. Now, it's, you, know, you have to contact them to see there's some things that they won't, but yes. Okay. And it's a, that's a great way if you've got, you or your loved one or a neighbor or anybody has equipment um, that they no longer need. Mm -hmm. To pass yeah, that on. They'll also take things that need some repair. Mm -hmm. a, a former member from here, Jerry Civic, does the repairs there. So. Nice. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes, John Jones. Um, <laughs> kind. Best presentation I ever heard. <laughs> ourselves in these situations with loved ones, could be kids, could be parents, where we've got we get a long arc of toxic history from the loved one, and there can be pressure and a norm that 
we've got to be there, we've got to be in the thick of it, and we've got to be a huge part of the solution. And I just want to say out loud that I don't know that that's the case. And, and when we talk about our abilities to say, what are my limits? What can I take on and what shouldn't I? I think, I think we just got to say sometimes that that's a part of it too, mm -hmm. is, that, is that long arc of crap that I've been fed or it's not working. And we just got to admit that because one of us could get in trouble with both of us down the road if we don't ask those questions and come in alongside and step mm -hmm. in here. You know? Good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that's hard to do. It's hard to say, you know what? They're my family member. I mean, I have a person who I know who who contacted me and said their loved one, their their sister was going to be discharged from the hospital. They needed to go someplace, and he was the only one who could take her. He said, I, I can't. I don't want to. There's been such a horrible history in our family. And you have to say, you know what? You have permission. You, you're not obligated. It's, it's a heartbreaker. That's where you dive in with the social worker, the district planner, to say, um, I feel bad about this, but I, I can't do this. So, yeah, good point. Other questions? I'll oh, add oh. real quick, if okay. I may. Sure. Um, just from my perspective, uh, once again, it's be proactive about this stuff. The best time to figure out you need that shower bench is not after you have fallen in the shower and broken something. Um, if you get the shower bench early because you realize that you're starting to have these problems, you don't have the ER visit, you don't have the short-term rehab, and you're able to stay independent. And that goes for the whole slew of services that we've talked about today, they've talked about, and last week and next week. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, James. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just add a tip um, also. From the very beginning of your presentation, when you talked about, I think it was you, um, having all your, your med lists and all that together. So my sisters and I, now we're sharing that on Google Docs. So whoever goes to a doctor's visit can update that. And then we're not constantly emailing each other updates. Mm -hmm. It's always updated and it's always available. Yep. Good point. Yeah, if you can do it electronic, it's a real time then. Yeah, Claudia. Also, when, because my parents were 800 miles away and I'm the only one, I used the neighbor mm -hmm. across the street because she observed and to get my dad to stop driving, he didn't have this, but we, I wrote to the state of Minnesota and they sent a letter mm -hmm. and that letter was enough to, for my dad to mm -hmm. say, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, the, you can contact the state and and fill out a form. Um, I don't know the rules now. When I was still at, at Bronson, it was the family could submit that confidentially and anonymously, right. and then the, the loved one would get a letter just saying um, you need to come in for an assessment. You're you're on hold now with your driver's for your, your driver's license. For um, we as medical professionals, we had to sign and put our name down there. And for some, I was. It, I'm like, I will. Absolutely, I will, because this person should not be driving. Yeah. Um, some people, the piece of le the letter that they get, that's enough for them. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, <laughs> if the state says I can't drive, I'm not going to do it. Some people still say, well, I'm going to keep going. And, you know, sometimes it's, especially if they're memory issues or cognitive issues, hiding the keys, taking them away, mm -hmm. doing whatever you can. Um, it's so tricky. It can be so tricky. Our primary care doctor offered to... Um, require Paul's cousin to have a driving yeah. test. He says, I'll be the bad guy. You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 We were having that discussion with my grandmother-in-law, and I looked it up, and yes, you can go and anonymously report to the state. <laughs> 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 and then just be surprised when they say, yeah, I got this letter. And they'll be like, oh, good idea. I think you should have that done. <laughs> you guys, I'd like to ask you to help us thank our speakers, because they not only did a terrific job, but they destroyed the magic. Thank you, all of you. We're around if you have questions. Yeah, I know. It's like everyone asks, like, good, and they cover different. Like, you don't feel like we talk about.
Right. 